Yeah, hello everybody and thanks for getting up this early uh, about the session on Nominatim on your laptop. So if you got up, I assume you know what Nominatim is. If you don't, um, then you have definitely used it because it's a software behind this little search box on the main website. Um, so it's a geocoder where you can search or you have a place somewhere and you can get the address of the place, know where you are. So the general wisdom is, oh, geocoding, this is something that needs huge servers, server farms, whatever. Google is doing it, so it must be expensive. Um, this is certainly true for the engine behind the search on the website. So that's Nominatim OpenStreetMap Org. Um, here you see the first server uh, we had with Nominatim, which has been long retired. Nowadays, we're running it on four servers, uh, three in Europe, one in the US. And yeah, if you... It's a little bit tiny, but you can see at peak times, it's 1,500 requests per second that we're handling. So yeah, that's a big installation. But the thing is, it's a big installation because we have these many requests. And me, I have always been running uh, Nominatim on my laptop because I'm developing, of course. So I know it's possible to have a small extract just there running it. Switzerland, no problem, do it on your laptop, uh, Belgium. But I was thinking, what if you want to go even, far, uh, even smaller? Uh, for example, uh, if you look at our usage patterns on our website, you see that every hour there's a little peak there, or rather a large peak. And I looked this up, and there is a home automation software asking every hour, oh, where's Berlin? And I'm thinking, it doesn't move, really. You don't need to do this. But yeah, there's home automation services who need this, they know the location and then they look up other stuff depending where they are. And I'm thinking, you shouldn't call an internet service for this. This is, this is weird. You should be able to run it on your home automation software. So on a little Raspberry. Um, or just on your phone, that would be nice as well. So I've been thinking, okay, how can we make this Nominatum thing smaller? And to know how this works, let's have a look on how geocoding works. So there's two sides to it. One thing is um, you start with the OSM data, and then you have an importer. So you process the OSM data until you get something which is actually geocodable, and you put it in Postgres database. This is heavy stuff. You can't do this on a small machine. Uh, this, uh, we can't do smaller. But the other side, that looks different when you want to do the search. So usually what you do now is you start with a client, say your home or your little Raspberry Pi. You go to the internet, ask a server. There's the search front end, which is running on our servers. At the moment, this is PHP. And it's basically a small front end to asking things in the database. So if you want to run this locally, we don't have internet. The first thing is then you don't need a web server. So what we want to do is replace the web server with a library, which you can directly ask your uh, geocoding stuff. The second problem here is PHP. PHP is not really something you want to use as a library. Um, so the question was there, can we replace it with something that's more friendly? Uh, in this case, Python. I'll talk about it in a second why. So we really have a library that's usable by many people. But then there's still this huge Postgres database. And well, if you have a Linux server, it's become easy to install these days. But if you have a Windows or something, it's getting more complicated. So can we make this smaller too? So and I was looking, that's what I've been doing in the last year with Nominatim. Can we make it small enough to put into an SQLite? SQLite is nice. It's also an SQL uh, database. So it works similar to Postgres, but it's in a simple file, so you can create a geocoding database and just copy it onto your phone, onto your home automation, onto your laptop or whatever. Much, much easier to use. So let's look into these steps, uh, what, what has happened in the last years. So the first thing is, as I said, I went from PHP to Python. Why? Why Python? That's a question I always get. So PHP is fine as a web service, but otherwise uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit aging. Um, if I look at the user stats, what we're getting uh, in, the, in the user agent, the two, two most used languages are Python and Java. So if you want to go for something that's usable by users, that's the two languages you want to do. Um, I went for Python because there's a rich library support there now. 
we'll have this uh, example of SQL alchemy in a second. But also, basically, geocoding is search, is language processing, and all the language processing. Also, if you want to go into chat GPT AI stuff, uh, there are Python libraries for this. So this gives us plenty of opportunity to do interesting stuff on top of the geocoder try a little bit. Um, the other thing I found nice is I want to make nominatum extendable that you can say, oh, I am, I don't know, I want to have a geocoder for Farsi and there's a little extra preprocessing I want to do. And this is really easy to provide in Python. Um, the disadvantage here is that you again have a language login. So as with PHP, um, going from Python to another language, have bindings there, it's, it's no fun. So if you want to do this, you have to do something like C or Rust or uh, whatever. The other disadvantage is mobile support that doesn't work with Python. Um, well, I'll have to think about this later. And of course, the question is always performance. Python is not the fastest language in the world. We'll look at this. So just an example for uh, language and to give you an idea how Nominotin looked before and after. So as I said, uh, the front end is mainly SQL queries, uh, long SQL queries, um, which uh, just execute the search. And you see on the left side, this is what it looked in PHP, lots of string concatenation. It's super fast, but really hard to maintain. And so switching to Python, I switched to SQL Alchemy, which is a really nice library, which kind of makes all this creating your SQL into Python function. And it's much more readable, but more importantly, you can put part of your SQL into functions and reuse it and split it up. And this makes it really much easier to maintain. And because we want to do SQL Lite later, this library also just works with both together. And that's really nice. Yeah, and speaking about performance, uh, when I started this, of course, I was always aware that this is a little bit slow, slower looking at performance numbers in the internet. Uh, and the first part, going from the uh, PHP to Python, you see, oh, this was a factor of two and a half or something, which was rather bad. Um, so if you ever want to do this, switch from another language to Python, be aware you have to think about performance from the first day. It's not like you implement it first and optimize later. You have to think about this. So I did this a little bit and we are still uh, slower at the moment, but given that this is a little bit of an unfair comparison, this is fine. So I showed you the SQL part. Of course, string concatenation is much faster. So this is a little bit of the price we pay here. And to be honest, uh, the forward search, so searching from name to, uh, to a place, um, I uh, changed the algorithm and basically how searching works is that you look at the query and then you say, okay, this is, could be an interpretation of the query and this could and this could and this could be and for every one you send the query. And if you want to be faster there, you try to do the right interpretation of your search query at the first hit and be done with it. So if you only have to send one query to the database, that's the fastest you can do. And then optimizing the PHP is really doesn't matter. Um, the other interesting thing with performance in Python where I had problems is parallelization. Um, so this is using, if you know Python, uh, asynchronous uh, calls. So basically uh, doing worker threads uh, with uh, multitasking, uh, not threading, but um, async IO. And on top of this, also multiple workers in multiple tasks. And here's the comparison how this works with the multiple task for PHP and Python. And what you see is you pay a relatively low, um, so there's a relatively low overhead when you go to multiple workers. And with PHP, uh, with Python, you don't have this. So really the workers influence each other somehow. And I still have no idea why but this is making the whole system a little bit slower uh, in the end when you have a uh, high throughput. Okay, so this is about Python. So the next thing I said, what we need is library. This uh, is in Nominatum since the last release for uh, three. It's currently still marked exper ex experimental because I might be changing the interface a little bit, seeing with uh, things changes here and there, but you can already try it out. 
And here's an example of what it looks like. And this also again shows why Python, because you all have all these libraries. Um, you want to write a little application which uh, you have geotagged photos and you want to put in the names uh, where, of the places where the photos are. And this is all the code you need. So you start with a library that reads the GPS coordinates. Ah, we have this, exif read is doing this. So that's the first three lines. Then you need another library which writes back the uh, places you found. This is the last three lines. Image tag is doing this. That's perfect. And in between the three lines, that's all you need to do to uh, query your local nominatum installation. So I'm not going to talk about how to set this up. Uh, there are other talks for this. Um, but once you have one, it's really just initializing the library and then using it in the same way you, almost in the same way you would be using the uh, web API. So it's the same calls we have at the moment. You do a reverse, you say, okay, that's my coordinates. I want to have more address details. I just don't want to know what the place is, but I also want to know the entire address. It's uh, Antwerpen in Belgium, in well, Europe you don't have, but you get the idea. What we then need to do is, uh, so you get a very rich result back. We talk about this in a second. Um, with all the names OSM uh, has in all the languages. So there's a little function which called, is called localize, where you can say, oh, I want to have it in English, please. And it's, doing, it's giving you a nice interpretation of the addresses in the language you, you want to have. So this is the address part. It's a list of your addresses. And you can just save this in your text. And now you have your photos nicely tagged with readable locations. So as I say, the library supports basically the same functions as you can find in the web API at the moment. So we have different kinds of search. The free text search, where you just type in some string and Nominatum tries to make sense of it. You can do structured search, uh, where you really have the uh, parts of your address. This is a postcode, this is the street, this is the house number, this is the city. Um, you also can be do properly, which is a little bit weird in the, in the web app. You can search for types of places. So I want to have all the um, venues, uh, event venues in Antwerpen. Um, so this can you can do this properly via the API. You can also do the same thing within a view box or within a uh, near a point. And then reverse, we've already talked about. You can do the lookup if you have an OSM object and want to know, okay, what's the address of this object? You can do this. And you can get just the full information that Nominatum has about an object, um, which is mostly useful for, for debugging. But I don't know, maybe you find some more information which you yourself want to use, which you're not allowed to do in the API. The details is really only for uh, viewing. Same filters, same constraints. I'm not going to mention them here. So as I said, you also have a lot more uh, information about your results. So instead of having this very restricted uh, GeoJSON, whatever you want to get back, you get all the information you basically find on the details page in the Nominatum UI. So the name, you can know what kind of OSM object is it. Uh, you get all the extra tags. If your database has the extra tags, you have access to them. And the same is true for the address details. So all the OSM objects which make up the address, you again get all the information uh, about them. And that means uh, if you want to play around with having nicer display names and saying, OK, in Belgium, I know uh, admin level like this, I want to leave it out. You can do all these things and uh, experiment a little bit with this. And in fact, I hope that people will do this. And we can do then a better display name uh, display on the website when people have experimented a little bit and say, oh, you see, if you do it like this, it's better. And then we can implement it on the official website uh, and do this there, for example. OK, this is the part of the library. And the final part of my pre presentation is about SQLite. This is really the newest part. It's partially available master. So I'm doing this as we speak. Um, as I said, using SQL uh, Alchemy really, really helped there. 
it's nice because it speaks two languages. Uh, so you can say, okay, read all the data from Postgres and dump it into SQLite, and you're almost done. Of course, it's never as easy as this, but that's the essential part. And then you see, oh, I have to build some indexes and everything. So there is a new comment, uh, command now for the GLI uh, version of Nominatem. You can say, okay, take my database and convert it into SQLite beta database, please. So this is the first try I did. Just checking out, okay, what's the sizes we get? And this is for a database which can only do reverse ge geocoding at the moment. So if you do search, it's a little bit larger because the search indexes are uh, quite significant. Uh, and what you see is you get about the same size as Postgres. So I did two tests here. One is, yeah, you have an extract, which is a usual uh, use case. You know all your uh, photos are in Germany, so that's all you need. Or uh, admin database means you're not doing geocoding, geocoding down to street level, but you stop at the place names. And if you have something like this photo tagging, this is normally what you need. You don't need the exact street and house number. You don't care. You just want to know, okay, it's, it was in Antwerpen, it was in Berlin or whatever. Um, this is still a little bit large to put it on your home automation system. But as I said, this was a full dump. So I think there's a lot of... Uh, room for improvement to just omit data in your SQLite database, which you never will use. Problem here is this depends on the use case. So I'm not yet sure how to do this, that you can really adapt this to your own, uh, what you want to do. Using it, that's really easy. Um, basically, for the user, nothing changes. What you normally do is you have this nominatem database DSN where you say, oh, there's my Postgres database. And what you do now is say, oh, I want to use SQLite. And in the DB name is the name of your file and you're done. And there's different ways to do this. You can normally, if you have a local installation, you have a project directory where you collect all the local data which are not in the database. You can just uh, edit there in your environment file. You can do it as an uh, environment variable in your shell. That works as well. Or you can even do it directly in your script uh, and put it there and say, oh, OK, just use this database, hard code it. Little bit on performance. So as I said, at the moment, it's only reverse, which is uh, implemented. Uh, so I check there how it's working using the same database on the same machine. This was a little bit of a larger machine uh, um, because it's a server I normally develop on. Um, but doing, uh, so this is really doing one request after the other, so no parallelization. And well, you can see, of course, Postgres is super fast with this. So if you have lots of data to geocode, you want to stay with Postgres. But SQLite is still doing 20 requests per second. And the things, uh, the application I was talking about, this is really normally enough for people to do. So what's next? Um, so I'm currently implementing forward search, which is a little bit more interesting if you want to know about uh, implementing indexes in uh, SQLite. I have a few interesting stories. Um, as I said, reducing the database size to make this really practical, uh, we need to get really down with the database size and not in the 20, 40, 100 gigabyte uh, sizes. Um, I'd like to see if I can make it faster, uh, which will be interesting because it's kind of making the faster for SQLite and finding better indexes there means we also make it faster for Postgres. Then, uh, so that's beneficial for both. And what I also like to do is, I don't know if you've heard about GeoPy. So this is a library where you can ge do geocoding against tons of different web services. Um, but it's all for the web, and Nominatum is one of them. So what I'd like to have there is uh, a plugin there where you can just have a drop-in and say, oh, I've done this until now on the web, and I just change the plugin and then use my local library uh, and my local installation. So this would be really nice to have. Yeah, thank you for listening. And if you have questions, uh, please go ahead. Um, thank, thank you, Sarah. So um, no questions from the live stream. Anyone in the audience got a question? And I'll run with the microphone. 
So, um, oh, it's a one. Okay, I was about to ask one. There we go. Say your name and then your question. Hi, thanks for the talk. I'm Alessandro. So you mentioned performance with multiple tasks going in parallel, um, but I'm, I'm sure you know about the global interpreter lock of Python. So maybe you could use multi-process. I don't know if you are already using that. Maybe that's the reason. Just yeah. So this was uh, multi-process. The thing is, um, what I was actually doing with Python is each process is doing yasing stuff. So having multiple uh, requests in parallel uh, running and uh, running. And I was I was thinking that this might be the problem because what I see is really uh, with Python uh, with PHP if you have one slow request. It's only the request is slow. And with Python, I really see everything else get slowed down as well, which might not be so bad for the uh, production service because uh, you don't get more requests coming in because there's something uh, slowing down. But it's still weird. And yeah, I don't know what's going. I have to, I have to look into this, yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? So I was curious. Um, so you're halfway through this because you've done the reverse side. Um, but when when did you finish that? And is anyone using this new Python version of nominator? Uh, as usual, uh, with open source development, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So of course, the um, what I did is I have this library, and then the web uh, API, which still exists, of course, works on top of this. And this is live. This is live on the Nominatem web server. So if you're so, uh, searching these days, you're using the new code. You're using the Python code. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anybody has uh, used this yet, but uh, it's really if, new. If they are and it's useful, they should let you know. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sarah. <laughs>